Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another excellent episode of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. As usual, I'm your host, Eric. Coslick. In today's episode, we explore the intersection of two beautiful beverages, beer and cocktails. And this is a fascinating subject to me because although beer and cocktails are very separate and distinct beverage categories today, there were various points in world history and in the history of the United States where the line between these two types of drinks was much blurrier. I was able to get a hold of cocktail author and beverage consultant John Yeager, who, along with his wife, Lindsay, runs a company called Poor Taste in Nashville. That's P-O-U-R Taste. See what they did there? John and Lindsay are preparing to release a really cool book in the coming months called The Ultimate Guide to Beer Cocktails, published by Skyhorse Publishing. And so it's great timing for us to talk about the weird and wonderful world of beer-driven cocktails. But before we jump into the interview, I think it's time for you to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is actually a beer tale called The Dog's Nose, which is about as classic a beer cocktail as you'll ever come across. To make one, you'll need one pint of dark ale. Porter will work here, but there are certainly other options. Two ounces of gin. London Dry is a traditional choice, but you know, depending on your beer, there's always room to play around a half teaspoon of brown or unrefined sugar. And you can go for a full tablespoon if the ale happens to be a dry one. And then finally, a dash of nutmeg. So what you do is you wanna get a heat resistant glass and you're gonna warm up the ale either stovetop in like a saucepan or in the glass using the microwave. And you wanna heat it up to the point where it's steaming but not bubbling or boiling. We talk about this later in the episode. Once you've heated up the beer, you add the gin and the sugar, and the heat of the beverage is going to allow you to dissolve that sugar by stirring and mixing in the ale. And then finally, once you've got the beverage mixed up, all you've got to do is either shake or grate a little bit of nutmeg right on top before you serve. To me, the dog's nose is a really great example of two classic beer tail moves that John and I discuss during this episode. Heating the beer is one of those moves that was very common back in the day, and adding spice to the equation is another classic beer tail hallmark. Some of the other topics John and I discuss during this interview include the vast sweep of beer history, zooming in and out to identify key moments in the development of the beer cocktail where and how these concoctions came about with special focus on Great Britain and the United States. The use of herbs, spices, and bittering agents like wormwood to create proto-cocktails with strange names like gruet, pearl, wassail, and posset. Classic and contemporary beer tales ranging from Jerry Thomas's Porter Punch to the Michelada. The answer to the ever-pressing question, what would Jesus drink, and much, much more. When you hear John talk about cocktails or history or flavor, you can tell just how deeply passionate he is about this subject matter, and that's one of the main reasons why I'm so happy to share this conversation with you all. We've got links in the show notes to the Amazon pre-order page for The Ultimate Guide to Beer Cocktails, so please head on over to Modern Bar Cart dot com forward slash podcast check it out for yourself and reserve your copy of this really cool book but for now i hope you enjoy this malty well hopped and slightly fermented conversation with cocktail author and mixology maverick john yeager john thanks for being on the podcast thank you for having me it's an honor excellent so as we do every interview could you just take 
a few moments and introduce yourself and basically tell people what you do and how we came to be here today. Yeah. So my name is John Yeager, and along with my wife, Lindsay, we own what we call uh, a cocktail creative out of Nashville, Tennessee called Poor Taste. What we do is so random, we don't know how else to describe what we do, so we just kind of shorten it to say that we're a cocktail creative. But what that means day to day is we got our start in 2011, we got our start doing a lot of events. Um, we were the first kind of bar consultants in Nashville. Now there's a, there's a dime a dozen. There's a million guys doing it. But so we do we do that. But then that has snowballed and that has grown for us to where we have our own podcast and we're launching a video series. We do a lot of brand work, a lot of brand consultation. We run the Nashville Cocktail Festival. We have our own product line. We do a, a handmade tonic syrup in the nation's or the world's only magnolia bitters. So there's just various things that we do all under the umbrella of all of this. And the reason I'm here today is because we got summoned to write a recipe book for beer cocktails. And so, yeah. So again, I'm super glad that you found us. Um, it's not even out yet and we're already starting to get pinged for it. So to, to some degree, our publisher is doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So as you mentioned, beer tales are the topic of this particular episode, but yeah. you know, I'm sure that we are also going to, especially in the lightning round, come and speak about some of the other aspects of, of what you do. Of I, I didn't realize those Magnolia bitters were you. I've, I, I came across those uh, when I was visiting my friend and co-founder, Ethan Hall, who um, is just now wrapping up his MBA at Vanderbilt. And uh, oh. I, was, I was checking those out at a few of the uh, local stores. So it's cool Sweet. to actually meet the guy behind the bitters. Yeah, yeah, we developed that for a restaurant in, I don't know, 2013, and it, very quickly we realized that we needed to hold those cards close to our chest because Garden and Gun popped out of nowhere and asked if they could have the recipe, and it was just like, oh, okay, this is a thing, so we took the appropriate steps to actually produce them ourselves and sell them. So yeah, so that's cool that you uh, found out what those were. Yeah, so let's let's jump into Beer Tales here, sure. and... Anytime, you know, there's an opportunity during the kind of general Q&A to talk about the book or mention something that you want people to know about the book, definitely feel free because even though it's not out yet, uh, we do want to get people excited about it. And um, we will definitely have links on our show notes page to the coming soon on Amazon. Yeah. And um, so people can just go there and uh, sign up for updates when, when it does go live or pre-order. So the first thing we should probably do is identify for people what a working definition of a beer cocktail or a beer tail might be. Man, this is like, you know, it's like the defining punk rock. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, um, you know, it's one thing to one person and another thing to another person. You know, a, a beer cocktail, I mean, in, in its simplicity is a mixed drink. A mixed drink that has, you know, I don't know, an appropriate amount of ale or lager. Um, I, I would say a noticeable amount. Um, I would say that, you know, even in our travels and in our, uh, not even research, and just before this whole book thing came up, I mean, my wife and I have, we had an app at one point. So we were traveling around like finding craft cocktail houses. And like there were people that were doing like beer syrups. And as cool as that is on paper, I don't know if that would be a noticeable ingredient. It's a great way to use leftovers, and I implore it. But at the same time, when I personally, when I define a beer cocktail, and there is a there is a noticeable amount of ale or lager in, you know, in a mixed drink that has spirits and some element of other ingredients, you know. For sure. So beer has to be a key ingredient. And I, I do like the distinction that you draw because uh, I think we are seeing things like IPA syrups and, and stuff like that getting a little bit more popular now. But mm -hmm. uh, so the actual, you know, from a can or a growler or a bottle or a tap, we need ha to have some noteworthy presence of an ale or a lager. That's it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so my next question in the definitions category is like, where does the spirit play into this? Because usually, you know, when we serve a cocktail, the main source of alcohol and in most cases outside of highballs, the, the, the majority of the volume of the cocktail is the spirit. Is that the case in a, a beer tail or does that sometimes get flipped on its head? 
Yeah, it totally gets flipped on its head. To me, there are two styles of beer cocktails, to me. And I don't know, you know, in, in all humility's sake, I don't necessarily reference myself as like an authority on the subject. But at the same time, because this is not our first time around the block and we have consulted for a lot of places and traveled all over all over the United States, I will say that what I see and what I feel is appropriate, like what I – like. And that's a big thing in the cocktail world. Like, what are you actually going to order again? Let's start there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. There are two styles of beer cocktails. And to me, there is a spirit-driven cocktail that has the addition of beer. And then there is a beer-based cocktail that has the addition of other ingredients. And I will put the period there. I will go so far as to say that I don't think a beer cocktail needs to have an, a spirit added to be the cocktail. So not only in our book, but I've seen other people do it as well. And we see it historically where we, you will have a base of ale with some element of bitters and some orange zest and um, bay leaf, right? I mean, you know, in, for all intents and purposes, that's a cocktail and that the beer plays the role of the spirit. You've got an alcoholic base with other ingredients. So I don't necessarily think a spirit needs to be present at all times. But I will say to me, the fork in the road is, are you making a cocktail with a little bit of beer or are you, you know, doing enhancing the beer in some way that is now um, there's some culinary art form to it that the brewer did not do himself. Right. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that's a really good distinction to draw. Of course, you know, those cocktail bartenders out there who insist that a cocktail is spirits, bitters and sweetener. They are not going to necessarily agree with uh, a beer cocktail sure. not having spirits, but I think f for our purposes, certainly in this conversation, that's a really useful distinction to draw. And of course, your point, are you going to order this again in the yeah. bar world? Yeah. You, you just want to make people happy. We're not, we're not sitting, most people are not going to walk in and, uh, you know, quiz you and grill you on your definitions before they drink. That, yeah, that, and there's a lot of historical reference too. I mean, obviously the, the, the geekiest of the bartenders, I mean, we could, me and you could sit in a crowd and we could push our nerd glasses up real quick and define a cocktail versus a toddy versus a julep versus a sling. There is a real historical, you know, prevalence on what it was to use beer as a base. So to, kind of to your point, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of bartenders that might not like that definition, but I think you and I would be the ones to remind them, hey, a cocktail, if we're looking at Civil War era United States with Jerry Thomas, a cocktail is one of many mixed drinks. And that's what we're talking about today is mixed drinks, not cocktails. Of course, of course. And I really love uh, something I've been thinking a lot about is those sort of proto cocktails. And hopefully we will be able to dig into a couple that yeah. I, I pinged you about. But so... First, I, I wonder if we can even go back a little bit further than that and talk just about beer tales as they existed historically. Like when did sure. people start adding stuff to beer in that culinary way that you started talking about? I mean, it, I, it's – gosh. <laughs> like, I, you know, I mean I could draw any card out of the deck and we could start there. And my point is, is like – you know, when we when I researched and when most people can through Google and Google Books and things, when you research how beer started, they started off as profound culinary mixtures. Now, the cave people of the day did not know that they were profound culinary mixtures. But beer today is what we have water, some element of yeast and sugar, uh, barley or malt. We've got some very rudimentary you know, ingredients that then turn into something quite beautiful. Back then, it was more than that. I mean, there were so many other spices and there were so many other herbs, I think just because they just had no idea what they were doing and they were just making it up on the spot, obviously. But this idea of when did beer and ale, when did ale and lager become kind of a mixed uh, drink ingredient? I mean, when I go all the way back to day one, Beer started as a very flavorful, very aromatic thing. And my point is, as I think over hundreds of years, that in certain circles and in certain co countries, that thematically just stuck. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, 
we can't just dive into all categories of beers, but I guess what I'm saying is as ale and lager became defined, you know, as different countries were putting their thumb on what they wanted to do, there were certain people that really stuck with what it meant to be aromatic and what it meant to be flavorful. And I don't know, I just, to me, it's, it's really interesting and I don't have it all figured out. I'll be the first one to say that, but when you start to connect, you know, it's world history. When you start to connect the dots and you see different, nationalities of people doing different things all at the same time with rel relatively the same ingredients. It's just very interesting. From a more traditional cocktail standpoint, I mean, Middle Ages, I mean, like a little bit after Christ walked. I mean, it's, I mean, very early on, we were taking very, like old wine and old beer that was not good and repurposing it. And that started what we would now consider the quote unquote like beer cocktail, you know what I'm saying? Right, exactly. And I think a really good counterpoint to reference when talking about, you know, when did people start adding other stuff to beer would be to ask, well, when did other people start adding stuff to wine? And we, we know very, without any doubt, that the Romans added uh, certain spices and herbs, and that is, you know, what came to be vermouth. And so during the same time, right, you know, we have people adding stuff to the beer. I mean, that's that's verbatim. That's it. <laughs> so I remember when I studied abroad in England, uh, and maybe we can use this as our kind of jump forward on the historical timeline of talking about beer in things that maybe start to approach looking like mixed drinks. I remember that each city kind of had its own brewery that you yeah. know produced that beer. And uh, I studied abroad in Bath. It was Bell Ringer Ale. And it was really cool to me that that was at pubs throughout the city. They all charged a flat rate for that Bell Ringer Ale so that no matter what pub you walked into, you knew that's exactly cool. what it was going to cost. Yeah, that's cool. So I think what we're talking about here is basically the difference between nano brewing and micro brewing. So nano brewing being those people back in the stone ages or at the time of Christ who were doing things at like sort of like a family or an establishment level where they were creating super hyper small batches of their beer and adding stuff to it. And when you went into one place, it was going to taste completely different than at the place next door. Whereas later on, we had more standardization as, as you say, you know, it's interesting to see entire nations or at, very, at the very least large groups of people doing the same thing and sort of, sort of making their stand on what they think a beautiful um, beer sure. is. So sure. can, can yeah. you talk about, you know, maybe that sort of period of brewing history and maybe some of the things that were coming out then? Well, yeah, you know, and, and uh, like I said, having done a beer cocktail book, I had to put as much emphasis on researching like beer as I did cocktails, which I'm well, much more versed in. But you totally hit the nail on the head. This idea that a nobody was looking to make a beer cocktail. I mean, we were we were predominantly using leftovers, whether it be the wine or the beer. And and you hit the nail on the head in the sense that like these were not commercial objects. You know, commercial breweries. I mean, didn't come about till what twelve hundred, you know, thirteen hundred. So at the time that Christ was walking, I mean, we were just doing it for our cousin's little birthday party. You know, I mean, it was like really small batch stuff. So. I, I think that there's a lot of dots that connect there in the sense that not only was it wasn't it wasn't commercial, but nobody was looking to like make this a thing. It was we were predominantly using leftovers. How can we make this better? Um, but as commercial brewing started to come about, you know, I mean, to me, it see, and I'm sure there's a lost document somewhere that I haven't read and maybe hasn't been discovered yet. I would go so far as to say I'm I'm curious if commercial brewing had to find its legs first before we started to remix again. You know, so when we look at like the sales and when we look at posets and things like that, I mean, those things were coming around 15, 16s, and 1700s, and that's a good thing. But to me, when I look at brewing history, I mean, there's hundreds of years before that where, you know entities that became businesses were cultivating their ale first. You know, they weren't mixing. I, I don't know. It'd be like somebody distilling for the first time a bourbon and they don't know what they're doing and trying to make a cocktail on day three. They've got to perfect their thing first. 
before somebody else gets the mix with it. So to me, there's that ambiguous time where I think commercial brewing, just like distilling, it's finding its legs, and then the art form to me kind of carries on. Right. I really like that distinction where, you know, we don't start seeing people experimenting with adding things back in again until uh, we are able to scale up a bit on the volume. And I think I am no expert on beer history, but logically to me, what comes to mind when I think about different, I suppose, nations brewing identities. So like we have a big difference between British ales and perhaps, you know, like a... Uh, a saison or yeah, something sure. like that. You know, sure. we, we talk about the the Belgian beers having this uh, very distinct Belgian characteristic, yep. and yep. what grows together goes together. And mm-hmm. so, if you have the prevalence of a particular type of ingredient or a particular type of yeast in your zone where you are actually producing all this stuff, it makes sense that as the beer and as the identity of that group of people kind of grows up together, those are going to be the characteristic flavors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and it's interesting to note, too, that historically, I mean, it was solely the British that had any idea of, like, this thing that we now call a beer cocktail. I mean, that comes from them. The Japanese were not doing it, and they were definitely brewing beer. You know, the Belgians and the Germans definitely weren't doing it, and they were excelling at beer. You know, so there was something about, and I think that really translates into cocktail history, too. And that's a whole nother story, but this idea that It was their merchants at sea. It was them conquering and conquesting the globe that saw mixed drinks coming out of Southeast Asia. And so to me, it's a very easily connected dot that when this idea that we're putting lime juice and palm wine and sugar in the same bowl that the guy next door says, hey, there's some leftover beer. What if? I mean, right. you know what I'm saying? Because all these other countries weren't doing that, you know, so I th- they're just I don't know. There was kind of a hotbed of innovation in England. Obviously, we broke away from that to come over here. But there was a, a, a time in history where it, as far as drink was, you know, that's where coffee houses were born was in England. And all of those things happened literally under the same roof. Coffee, you know, you know, beer and these possets and punch, all those things. Right. Yeah. And this, I think, starts to bring us into that category of the proto cocktails. So, you know, you make a great point. Obviously, we have, you know, the the Brits are traversing the globe, conquering as they go, and then sending all of these foreign spices and other ingredients back home for their wealthy citizens to enjoy. Can we talk about, you know, we've mentioned posets and wassails or wassels, or I, I'm still not certain how to pronounce it. But <laughs> I think um, it depends on who you ask, yeah. So, can we talk about some of the things that people in those early days of mercantilism started doing? with beer and other types of spirits and ingredients? So wormwood was a real big thing. And that's this is what gave us Pearl and then Pearl Royale. I don't know if you've heard about this, but Pearl uh, was one of the first proto beer cocktails, you know, and it was this idea. It was hot ale steeped with wormwood. I mean, there was a couple of guys that did a few other things to it, as us bartenders do. I'm going to take your recipe and enhance it a little bit. But it was – infused beer. But to me, this was very much a proto cocktail in the sense that somebody was doing something else or something additive than what the brewer designed. So to me, that's like, okay, cool. Now we're in cocktail territory. You know, Pearl Royale was the same thing, but with wine, it was kind of a grown up city cousin where Pearl was, you know, a little bit more prominent, like in the countryside. But this idea in this time, it, the ingredients, I think that there was a lot of experimentation I don't think a lot of them succeeded, but you know when we look at possets and things of that nature, we do see cream, we do see sugar, we do see eggs, and there's these it, these are the predecessors to eggnog, but there was a lot of experimentation with like bittering agents, you know. So again, it's like we can kind of connect the dots, you know, one camp of people coming up from Italy up to northern Europe versus another camp of people, you know, making the same path. Again, a lot of different people experimenting with relatively the same ingredients. But, you know, it's not to be forgotten that as kind of this beer cocktail prototype was being invented, like the the, the bittering agents and herbs and spices were like really big outside of juices and outside of cream and outside of eggs, which some people might consider more, I don't know, traditional, quote unquote, cocktail ingredients. You know what I'm saying? Right. And the Brits are not strangers to different bittering agents. In fact, their first 
kind of crack at beer was called, I'm sure you're aware of, it's called Groot, G-R-U-I-T. And they basically, they didn't use hops as a bittering agent in that as as we now understand most beer is is, is involving hops they used uh like some dandelion root and burdock and other things that's um, exactly right so yeah that's that's a really cool access point is the pearls and is that p u r l yeah p u r l and then the wine based version is p is is the yeah p u r l royale but yeah and and i talk about gruet in in the book you know i mean really the gruet came around in i mean through the romans and it played a huge role in the reformation I mean, there's been a lot of writing about that, um, and that's a whole other history lesson. But yes, this idea that like, and we and we kind of break that down in the book from just a 101 flavor perspective. So, like for example, like some common ingredients in the first recorded recipes in Gruet um, were juniper berry and ginger, right? So, and so what I like to do is I like to kind of break that down. And let's make a beer cocktail. These were just spices and, and bittering agents for them. But let's, from a flavor 101 standpoint, let's make a cocktail out of that. Juniper berry obviously is the dominant ingredient in a London style dry gin, right? So let's make a gin cocktail. If they're going to use ginger, let's put ginger in there. We'll make a cocktail out of that. We can add a little lime or lemon juice, obviously, just for balance and top it with a specific tile, style of beer. But point being is, Yes, it's really interesting to look at the ingredients and the flavors that they offer in Gruet, and now we can kind of deconstruct that and make a cocktail out of it. It's a really cool starting point. Absolutely. I really like the idea of taking an original recipe and kind of breaking that down and giving it new legs as a, as a modern cocktail, because obviously back when they were doing these things, cocktails didn't exist. Exactly, exactly. But they're great starting points for flavor. If they have put the flavor in there, it must be good. So let's deconstruct it, make it something that makes sense to us. Right, right. So we've got Pearl and and Gruet as these two first experiments in beer tales. Now, uh, can we talk about wassails and posets? Yeah, yeah. You know, and to be honest, I... You know, I, I'm I'm not the most well versed on these. You know, I mean, it's just like obviously when you're researching cocktails, I mean, it's just like my God, <laughs> it's like a lifelong. Ask David Wondrich. I mean, he's literally spent his whole life digging all this stuff up. But yes, uh, to me, this is when this is when it starts to at least look like a cocktail. It's not that experiments hadn't happened before, and it's not that some of these experiments weren't good. Because to me, it's like wormwood, that thing that defines absinthe, and the, the, um, it's a defining character in a lot of different, you know, aperitif wines and bitters. You know, that steeped in beer is probably really good if put in the right hands. Okay, I'm just right. going to leave that there. Be, then that's for me. That's I like the aromatic, but my point is, is when possets. And when sales start to come around, these start to look a little bit more like cocktails. These start to look a little bit more familiar. I don't know. They start to look look a little bit more white. <laughs> things that we are just like really used to here in America. Things that we subscribe to is like, oh yeah, cool. And it just you know, and it's and it's no, it's a no brainer that a lot of modern bartenders are kind of going back to these drinks. These are the precursors to eggnog. So it's it's easy to wrap our heads around for us just being predominantly from over there, you know, not everybody, but a lot of us are from over there. It's just a tradition that has stuck. So I, I would say that there's a lot of other traditions that are just as good, if not better, that did not stick, but that's that's where we are right now. <laughs> For sure. So when would one, or I guess there, there's certainly, for at least for Wassail, a... I guess, yearly or a, a holiday aspect to it in that they created this particular concoction around the Christian holidays. So what what were in these more, I guess, noggy or eggy or creamy cocktails? And when were people making and enjoying these? I mean, I mean, gosh, starting starting in, you know, the, the medieval times, I mean, working more, our way up to the 1600s and the 1700s. Yeah, I mean, a posset, I mean, it's basically just, it's beer, you know, and we've got, and we're ba- we're basically whipping beer into something that will turn into a custard. So if you okay. can think of like a custard that is kind of not even really a drink, I mean, it's something that you probably could, it's so thick you could eat with a spoon, but we've whipped beer into it. That's a real 101. 
And I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you it's a 101. There's more to it than that, but that's a really good way to, you know, kind of wrap our head around it. To me, the wassail, I, I don't know if it's better. It seemed a little bit more interesting because there was a little bit more of that gruit um, trajectory. There was a little bit more of letting things steep for 24 hours. There was a little bit more of an intentional kind of mixological mindset behind it to me. They, you know, obviously they're both good. I love eggnog. <laughs> you know, I can drink the crap out of it, you know? Right. Um, and that's kind of where the posset kind of, that's the family tree that that started. But all that said was sale to me when I see some of the first recipes, at least that I could find, I'll put that in there. I don't know. There just seemed maybe a little bit more like preparation where the posset was just like, cool. Like we've got the stuff. Let's throw it in the bowl. Right, right. It seems the pot posits to me seem a little bit more culinary in that, like, as you mentioned, yes, you're you're involving a lot of heavy cream and texture. And at the end of the day, you're doing quite a bit of chewing when you consume this. And so it's a little bit harder yeah. to call it like a traditional cocktail type drink. Right. Yeah. You're not sipping it through a straw. <laughs> <laughs> so and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but when I think of a wassail or a wassail, to me, it's a almost like a dark beer punch yeah. and there are i believe some versions of it where they actually floated biscuits on top right yeah i have seen those recipes and i i, I don't know why <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've never tried it and our we have a poor taste cocktail club that meets once a month here in nashville and we did a i don't know it might it wasn't last Christmas, but it might have been the Christmas before. We did a whole class on it. Um, but you know, one the that the thing that I said at the very beginning is the one thing that you can walk away with that'll get you started in your own recipes is instead of a mold wine, which we're all fairly familiar with, this is mold beer. I mean, that's a really good way to at least think about it and wrap your head around it in the sense that you're you've you've heated up beer and you've let things steep in it. And so at that point, a lot of our, you know, members, you know, who had just never even heard of this, they're like, oh, okay, I at least get it. I at least get that there's a stovetop involved, if not a crock pot. I at least get maybe the kinds of things that I can put in there. So just kind of, again, kind of deconstructed it enough to be like, oh, okay, cool. Right. And and mold dark beer is a perfect way to put it because just like in mold wine, you're using these baking spices like cinnamon, like cloves and star anise. Those to me are like three big ones. But are there any other ingredients that you commonly find in a wassail that are that are used to infuse it? I have seen. I, well, OK, I have seen brandy a lot. I haven't I haven't done a ton of research on it. And the research that I've done are in notes that are not in front of me because obviously it's hard to remember all this stuff. I've seen a lot of brandy, but f for me, it was fun to just – when I kind of made my personal connection point with, yeah, this is basically a mold beer instead of a mold wine, to me, I started to work with flavors in my own brain. So like by no means do I see this historically, but a certain style of beer when it's heated up, you know, could you have like a Blanc vermouth or a dry vermouth to kind of pull it in a different direction? It's not going to work with every style of beer. Or, you know, if you are heating up a really super dark style of beer, you know, a dark caramel color Amaro, like an Averna or a Chia Charo, you can really start to think about the ways that this very, uh, it's not a simple drink, but this rudimentary drink can grow. Right. So a couple takeaway points, because I think this is actually of the early beer cocktails, something that people can start to play around with at home, probably the most easily. Yeah. M my takeaways would be the following. One, it's mold beer. And when you when you're mulling a wine, one of the things to, to keep in mind, and this was something that my friend Maria Littlefield, who runs the Owls Brew, brought up to me and and she said, you know, of course, when you're when you're mulling a wine, you, you don't want to boil it because once yep. you add that much heat to the equation, what you're going to be pulling out of those spices like cloves and star anise and cinnamon is a little bit more of the bitter tannins that you don't want in there. So the, that it. would be That's one it. takeaway. Yeah. So yeah. keep keep it warm, but don't boil it. And then yep. I really like the things that you were just mentioning about perhaps fortifying your wassail with brandy or with something like an Amaro or a vermouth, yeah. especially if there's something in particular you're going with for a theme or a flavor that you're shooting for. Uh, and then using the stuff that we have today that people didn't have back when they first invented these drinks to kind of play in there.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, like to to me, just off the top of my head, I'm just making this up as I go. But like to steep an oatmeal stout and have an amontillado style of sherry, or darker, if not a PX, you know, or sure. an oloroso. I mean, to me, those are things that go together. I know we can make it good cold, but um, man, it would be a really fun experiment to heat that up with maybe traditional baking spices or something else. But yeah, I think there's a lot of like. Like you said, a lot of ways to fortify it and to make combos that can now kind of get us into 21st century hot beer cocktails, you know? Sure. And I guess my last little Wikipedia note here for folks is that there is a traditional English Christmas song that actually does refer to wassail. And he here we come a wassailing. And right. it was sort of expected that when people went out caroling, I'm sure there was a designated date for this so that people could have their wassail prepared, but they would actually show up at the doors and just like in, you know, traditional American culture, what you would greet carolers with a hot beverage or something like that, or some food, you know, you'd be greeted with wassail at the door when yeah. you caroled. It was like adult trick or treat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's I'm going to sing you a song it. and I will take that on the stove. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. So I think that covers some of the, the early beer tales and certainly connects us. It brings us from the Middle Ages where things were a little bit murky up to the time when we were starting to put things together to look like cocktails. Is there any are there any other types of cocktails that involve beer that were popular before prohibition or are those things that we're more dealing with in today's world of experimentation? I yeah, I mean, you know, going back to the godfather of mixology himself, Jerry Thomas, you know, he was – you and I know this, but maybe some of your listener, listeners need to be reminded. He was the first person to put into print the growing trade of mixed drinks. So unlike my book, unlike any other cocktail book that's out now, this wasn't a coffee table thing or this wasn't something that he was writing for parties. This was a trade manual that was going from one bartender to another. This was a – like – I, I can't say secretive, but it was a it was a trade manual. And if you weren't behind a bar, you would have no other interest to read it. Right now, cocktails are a fad. My mom wants cocktail books, you know, just because it's they look pretty and they're cool. But he wrote this the very first trade manual. And my point in bringing him up is I find it very interesting that he dedicates a couple of pages to punches or individual drinks that do have beer in them. So to me, he did not make up cocktails. He was just the first person to put it in print and to make it look like a recipe book. He categorized them for us. And so to me, that that reasoning says that putting beer into a mixed drink was enough of a thing for him to dedicate a few pages for it post-Civil War, right? So right. My, my favorite is Porter Punch. Porter punch. I mean, it's basically porter ale. You've got a little bit of brandy and cucumber with nutmeg on top, and it is phenomenal. Interesting. So, is the cucumber an infused thing, or is that muddled in there? Uh, we always muddle it when we hand make it. Interesting. Very, very cool. Are there any other of those Jerry Thomas cocktails that jump out at you? Well, as far as beer, I mean, yeah, I mean, he was working with all kinds of stuff. I mean, he, he, you know, he didn't have like crazy like IPAs to work with. I mean, his were fairly rudimentary in the sense that you were working with basic styles. You would have one with English ale and he would infuse it with capillaire and capillaire was a bitter orange syrup. So he would make a simple syrup and infuse bitter orange peel into it. And so it was just ale and that bitter orange syrup. We have a play on that in our book and, and it's good and it's simple. And this gets me back full circle to maybe one of the first things that I said, that I don't necessarily think a spirit needs to be an ingredient in a beer cocktail. I mean, I think the professor himself, Jerry Thomas, says that just this syrup into this ale is good enough, <laughs> you know? Right. So, right. I don't, yeah, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things that he was experimenting with. But again, post-Civil War United States, he's only experimenting with very basic styles, porter, ale, a traditional lager. I, I think that that's it. <laughs> like yep. I don't think that he's calling for anything else. For sure. I really like thinking of Jerry Thomas in the way that you just portrayed him as kind of like the first guy who wrote the Odyssey. You know, we know yep. that Homer was the the author per se, 
But it, that story was passed down via the oral tradition for hundreds of years before anybody yeah. ever decided, hey, maybe I should probably scribble this down so we don't forget it. Yeah, yeah. And and so, you know, it makes sense that, like, yeah, back then they weren't, you know, quibbling over, well, is this a cocktail if it doesn't have a spirit? Because, you know, that was the one, that was the first bartender's guide that Jerry Thomas put down. And so it was just, that's just the way things were. And there was really nothing to argue about. It was just, all right, here's how you do it. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so this brings us up to modern day pretty much, I think. Mm -hmm. And are there any modern cocktails out there involving beer that people might want to be on the lookout for if they uh, go to a cocktail restaurant, say for brunch or something, where they, they might have some beer tails on the menu? Well, to me, that's a trick question. I would say no. I would say that um, pri before... Well, okay, let, let me reword what I was going to say. From 1900 up until, I don't know, five years ago, I mean, you're basically dealing with the Margarona, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. That could have come out of Applebee's or something, you know, 20 years ago. I, I, nobody really knows where that was invented. My point is, is there was not this trajectory of beer cocktails that has been well documented. Not saying it wasn't done, but there was no documentation of it. And so to answer your question, no, there are no like classics like the Sazerac or like the Ramos Gin Fizz that people must order. So what I'm saying is when you go to a restaurant and order a beer cocktail, I am you are ninety nine point nine 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 percent just getting something that that dude has made up specifically for that restaurant. I would go so far as to say that most good craft bartenders today aren't even referencing Jerry Thomas. And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. I don't say that you have to, but I have trained bartenders all over Nashville and it's, you know, to me, his bartender's guide is the Bible for our world. And when you open it up and you point to things, I mean, bartenders all over, just like, oh my God, like I had no idea. Right now they are talented in their own right. So they are making things up that unbeknownst to them had been done 200 years before that. But point being is to answer your question, if a guest walks into a restaurant and gets a beer cocktail, it is rare that you are getting something that is historically relevant. <laughs> I mean, outside of, I mean, you know, I just, there might be a few places in the United States that are doing posits. I mean, and, and that, and it, it would probably only be around Christmas time, you know, right. now beer cocktails are obviously a thing, but you're getting something that is, you're just getting something very modern. Right. So, yeah. So there's not going to be any classics to request. I'll put it that way. Okay. That makes sense. A couple that seem to be a little bit more common than others are the Michelada and the yep. Dog's Nose. Yep. Yep. Now, okay, so the Dog's Nose, I don't know anything about. The Michelada, obviously, that's Mexico's horses in the race. You know, I mentioned that in the book. But uh, – Again, it's I mean, it, it's it's good. I've had many of them in my lifetime, you know, but these are relatively modern drinks. And that's and that's OK. Sure. What and what is what is a Michelada? Because I think that's one that, that is a little bit more prevalent than some of the others. In its simplicity, Michelada is a uh, Mexican lager with lime juice and some element of spice. Now, this could be hot sauce that is dashed in or it could be actual spices that are dusted in or some craft bartenders are taking it so much to where they're doing like a like a spice syrup or they're doing some sort of infusion. But it's a light Mexican lager, lime, and some element of spice, like a pepper. Right. And so that'd be closer to a wassail than anything that is more – Oh, totally. Yeah, anything that's that, had, that adds spirits to it. They're not like dumping a bunch of tequila in there as well, correct. right? Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, a Michelada is just beer with some added – like flavor. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, totally. And you're right. And I, to be honest, I've, I have not, you know, connected those dots before that would be the closest semblance of a wassail. Obviously we're dealing with a whole different spice tray, <laughs> you know, but For yeah, sure. I mean, they're very similar. And I've, I've seen things here in the mid Atlantic. I don't know if you're familiar with uh national Bohemian beer, but they call it Natty Bow. It's okay. a bit, it's big in Baltimore. And the other thing that is big in Baltimore in the spice world is old Bay. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've seen here in the Mid-Atlantic in Baltimore and in D.C., especially when there's like a seafood theme, they will do either like an Old Bay syrup or uh, they will simply serve a glass of Natty Bow with an Old Old Bay rim. And I don't know if I want to go ahead and call that a beer cocktail, but it's certainly on its way toward that. 
I couldn't agree more. I mean, I just my first time hearing about it. I think it sounds awesome. I would totally try one, and I couldn't agree with you more. Don't know if it's like a beer cocktail per se, you know, because it's like it, it just. Uh, I'm I'm trying to find the words for it. It d- just having a rim. I don't know. That'd be like saying because your band has a saxophone, you're a jazz band. It's like, well, no, not really. <laughs> right. Or I think a different way to say it might be that if you don't want to put that sugared rim on your sidecar or your brandy crusta, maybe it's still a sidecar or a brandy crusta. Just because you put a sugared rim on something doesn't does exactly, it. exactly. Yeah, and that's that's a great analogy. You know, I would say that if they wanted to add something else to it to make it more I don't know, to make it more culinary in some way, we would be getting to a beer cocktail. But yeah, I I, I couldn't agree with you more. But it sounds good. I would love to to try it. Yeah. So we've got a really good sense of both the history and some great examples of beer cocktails. I'm hoping that we can give people a bit of a preview of your book without spilling all of the secret sauce so that they still want to want to pick up a copy and read through it. But sure. When did you know that the world needed this book, and who are you writing it for, essentially? <laughs> I didn't know that the world needed this book. We were called and asked to do it. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I mean, so in all humility's sake, I mean, with our publisher now out of New York City, Skyhorse Publishing, and they've been a great team to work for, but they called us uh, two and a half years ago, and they said, we want to have this on our roster, and we heard that you were the people to do it. And Lindsay and I were like, heck yeah. And like, that's, that has been the trajectory of poor taste. You know, we've been full time for almost eight years and there's just been so many random things that we've had the opportunity to do. And it, in their research of us, they were right. We had done some beer cocktail events in our consultation here in Nashville. We had placed some beer cocktails in some pretty predominant restaurants here. So we, it wasn't, you know, foreign to us, but This was our first time authoring a book, that's for sure. So I had to be, you know, they had kind of had to hold my hand a little bit. But yeah, so, you know, I I think my brain is split down the middle. I sympathize and half agree that there are so many cocktail recipe books out there that how could we possibly need another? I, I am actually, part of me is on that camp, okay? But the other side of me says... I do feel like we're bringing something to the table that has not been discussed. And my my gut tells me, and kind of like I said just a few minutes ago, when we train bartenders here in Nashville, I mean, when we open up Jerry Thomas's book or some other early manuals, not just beer cocktails, but there's all, there's so much stuff that was happening then that modern bartenders today just don't know about. So to me, that's kind of a red flag, like, oh, then there's something else to say, you know? Exactly. Maybe we, maybe we are still bringing something to the table. So in our history portion of the book, I mean, it's a recipe book, but in our history portion to kind of set the stage, I mean, most cocktail people don't know anything about Gruet and don't know anything about the fact that Gruet wasn't far off from Amaro. You know what I'm saying? Now, exactly. all, bar, all bartenders under God's green earth love Amaro. I do too. But when you start to translate that into how you fortify beer, then it's like, ding, okay, there's the green light. Now now I'm working with something. So to me, that was like, okay, now I have something to say. So I don't know. But I, I sit in both camps. <laughs> well, I really like what you say about having something to add to the conversation. My background is in rhetoric and, you know, in teaching English 101 for a few years at the University of Maryland. You know, this is the way we... You need to help me. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know about that. I have not written a book either. I just sit and talk into a mic. But, uh, um, you know, one of the ways that we talk to students about entering an academic conversation is like, listen, this conversation has been going on for hundreds and thousands of years before you showed up here in this class, and yeah. it's going to c- continue going on. The real question is, what do you have to add to it? And and when I look around in today's industry, especially in the beer world, and I see all this consolidation with big brands buying up medium-sized brands and other medium-sized brands following or falling rather to the the nano breweries that are sure. around the corner from you. Um, yeah. You know, you can start to see a bit of a beer bubble, and part of the other cause of that bubble is the fact that 
We have done a pretty much everything we can think to do to beer. We've got <laughs> yeah. uh, beer. Yeah. My perfect example is Brunch Weasel by, oh man, uh, now now I'm blanking on the brewery, but it's a, a beer brewed with Cape Luac, which is the coffee beans that are ingested by... Oh, the uh, goats. Uh, I believe it's a, a, a weasel. It's called a civet. Oh, um, oh wow. and, and yeah. it's actually digested by the civet cat and uh, excreted sure. in, in, yeah. in the way that that happens. And uh, then then it's it turns into this premium coffee product because it's gone through the digestive tract of the weasel. And we've made beer that includes that. So <laughs> I, we've done pretty much all there is to do. And, and yet, yeah. uh, you know, there's still things when you open these old manuals that people aren't talking about. So I do think that there is a real saying. a real draw for this book. Is there any way that you decided to organize it or is there any logic to the content or, or value in the way that you set the book up that people might be interested in? Yeah, I mean, Lindsay is she is very well thought and thorough and is a wonderful wife and business partner. And yes, I had a bunch of ideas of how I wanted to categorize the book, all of which she lovingly shot down and for good purpose. Um, cause she really kind of thought through, uh, you know, we just, we wanted to make a book that was for everybody. So I wanted to make a book that some industry people could be like, Oh, you know, cause we'll talk about like this, a recipe that we made up is inspired by this thing from Jerry Thomas, for example. And so obviously, you know, like I want bartenders to realize that like, man, like we don't have to literally just make everything up. We can embellish, you know, or be inspired by things that have already been done. And so she was helpful for me because I knew that I wanted to do a history part. And so she kind of helped me. I don't know. She kind of helped ground my feet a little bit in the sense that like making a book for everybody, because I think maybe what I was trying to do would have probably been a little bit too industry, you know, but now this is a book that like my mom can read and it, and you know, and she gets it, you know, so the language in it is, and I think maybe that might be a strength for us as poor taste is we have found a way to get into the nerdiest of conversations and, make it fun, make it entertaining. You know, we want people to just all people to feel welcome. So to answer your question, yeah, it's, there is that history part and we definitely reference some things, you know, that don't apply to everybody, but there is an overarching, um, I don't know. There's an overarching ease to the book. There's an overarching sense of joy to the book. And right. so she, she was very helpful for that. Like, okay, if this gets picked up by anthropology, like those people don't give a shit about what you're talking about. And I was like, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know? Sure. And I, obviously that's one of the, the instances in which being an expert and after going through a deep dive, you know, uh -huh. and doing all your research that actually becomes a liability when you start to try and communicate those things and make them accessible. Yeah. Um, and I think the beauty of this podcast that we're speaking on right now is that we have people who are bartenders who are listening to us, and then we have people who are just beginning their journey as home bartenders. And so awesome. I think hearing you say that is is a real good selling point for this book because when we get emails from people thanking us for what we do, that's the first thing they usually say is like, man, I've listened to podcasts before, but yours is the first one where it actually – sounds like a conversation between two normal people as opposed to a couple of guys just spewing industry yeah. speak. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's solid. Seriously. That's what we need more of, I think. <laughs> well, that's great. So again, we will put lots of links in our show notes page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast so that folks can find the place to either reserve a copy of your book or sign up for updates so that they know when it finally gets published. Uh, yeah. But for now... Could we do a few lightning round questions? Of course. Awesome. One, what is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite cocktail of all time, as many people who work with them day in, day out do not, what is a cocktail you've more recently fallen in love with? Oh, my absolute favorite cocktail of all time is called the Vucare. It's a New Orleans classic from 1938, and I'm sure you know what it is, but for your listeners, it is rye whiskey, cognac, sweet vermouth, benedictine, Angostura bitters, and Peychaud's bitters. This singular cocktail caused me to fall in love with this whole world. I love it so much that we printed shirts that simply say, do the voo, 
and they're available at poortaste.com. And it's kind of a, you know, I don't know, kind of a cult thing with bartenders. We've had a lot of people from all over the country that will buy these shirts. We sell them at our Nashville Cocktail Festival. But I just love it so much. We printed shirts about it and just, hey, when all else fails, man, just do the voo. <laughs> nice. Uh, big fan of the voo carré. You are in good company with folks uh, who have also favorited that one. Yeah. Do you have any uh, any favorite rise to use with that? I mean, gosh, at this point in 2018, there is a lot <laughs> of rise. In 2010, when I got my bartending start, I mean, it was all based off Rittenhouse. Old Overholt was a great second choice. And then if when in a pinch, I would go for Bullet Rye. But when I was doing Bucharest for the first time, it was either Rittenhouse or Old Overholt. You know, Absolutely. Both, both are just obviously very economical and they very much get the job done. For sure. Awesome. If you were a cocktail tool or ingredient, what would you be and why? <laughs> oh my gosh. If I was a cocktail ingredient, what would I be and why? Um, I would be, and I, I, I haven't even looked at these questions, so this might answer two questions in one. If I were a cocktail ingredient, I would be brandy. Interesting. The reason I would be brandy is because, and this is my favorite spirit category of all time, and there's a whole other conversation to have about that because it's a wide net, but it, it would just be solid to know that people who knew what they were doing were grabbing for me only. I like it. I like and, it. And that would be, that would just be nice. <laughs> yeah. The, the, it's the John Yeager, the sophisticated choice. That's right. <laughs> That's right. The choice of a new generation. <laughs> do you, uh, do you sleep in a snifter? No, no, I used to, but we've got two little girls now, so I am more in a bowl of Captain Crunch than anything these days. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Another fun question. If you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would that person be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just kind of paint a picture for us. Man, I'd have a cocktail with Jesus and I would have him turn some water into some really fine ass sherry. Okay. <laughs> That's what I would do. Where would you be? On a beach of his choice. Beautiful. Yeah. That's that's an interesting scene for for sherry conversion, yeah. water sherry conversion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, Are, that's what I would do. Uh, nice. Are there any books about beer or cocktails that have been particularly influential or enjoyable besides the Jerry Thomas Bartender Manual? I, specifically, David Wondrich's Punch. That really gives. I think the most in-depth um, history for the world of cocktails, it obviously starts with a communal version of cocktails called Punch, but seeing how he lays out the history of communal drinking going into individualized drinks is profound, I think, for any bartender. And then, you know, I mean, I really like a lot of what Jeff the Beach Bum Berry does. I love, you know, there's a fad of tiki right now that I love, and I'm like way on the train. But I will say that even years ago, before tiki bars were opening up just left and right, I appreciated the offshoot. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not trend, but like. I just I appreciated just this offshoot punk rock version of the cocktail world through all of his writings and through what tiki culture is that in its most basic form, like beer cocktails, says that there aren't rules. I can I can walk into a space where there are rules like the Vucare. I mean, that is a, I will take that recipe to the grave. I obviously didn't make it up, but it's like that is that is an example of, yes, there are rules. But I think life is balanced when you have m more than one thing, when you have a couple different things going on at the same time. A tiki is a wonderful example. Beer cocktails is another example where you have this culinary offshoot where there are no rules. I mean it's the difference between classical music where you must play those notes how they are written versus jazz. You know, And I think a music buff is built on both. Sure. For sure. Yeah, you got to know the rules first and then and then uh, of course the impulse is to to break them and see what happens, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. If you could give any piece of advice to someone who's just starting to learn about or experiment with cocktails, you know, being an expert and as somebody who's been doing this for a long time, what advice would you give? Gosh, start with just just be comfortable with the classics and just have a lot of classics. 
<laughs> and make sure that you're getting classics from the right places, from the right people, and just really wrap your head around those things first. Um, I, I find it unfortunate when bartenders who have been doing this for a year are just, they, I don't know, they, I have met people in, in my path, I'll, I'll say it this way, who have been a little heady or a little ahead, ahead of themselves and having made up all these recipes. And some of them might, might not even be that bad, but I, I don't know. You can just tell. You can just tell when somebody doesn't have a fundamental sense of balance, a fundamental sense of you know methodology of how you build things. Even in tiki, even in beer cocktails, even in a space where there are no rules – Having a fundamental sense of how flavors work together is just extremely important, and that's across all art forms, whether you're cooking, whether you're doing ballet, whether you're writing rock and roll music. I mean, there's just – I mean, you know, you connect those dots how you will. I mean, there's some rudimentary things that you must know before you start writing your own stuff. And so people getting into this world, I, I, I find myself so much just going back to the classics. I mean, I go back to Jerry Thomas's what I consider the Bible all the time to just because there's recipes in there that I haven't made in six years. And I just I need to familiarize myself. Just I don't know. I just to me, it's always good to just kind of go back to the basics. For sure. And the way that I often think about the classics in terms of, you know, people learning how to do cocktails is is like a tuning fork, right? You know, if you learn how yep. to do a great old fashioned, that's a tuning fork that you can always return to yep. when you are trying to do a riff on the old fashioned. That's exactly um, it. That's it. Yeah. And, and you kind of, once you can kind of internalize that vibration, then, uh, that vibrations with you. And it's always kind of a, a source of, uh, knowledge and stability when you, when you go off map. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly it. You're absolutely right. Well, John, I want to be respectful of your time. I really appreciate your insights in beer cocktails. Sure. And can you just let folks know how to find you digitally and, of course, you know, where you'd like them to go to either for an email list or, uh, you know, reserve a, an advanced copy? Sure. Yeah. So our company name is called Poor Taste. It's P-O-U-R-T-A-S-T-E. And people can go to poortaste.com or they can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Poor Taste. I mean, we are active social media people, always posting, whether it be info about events or festivals that we do or the book. I mean, so, I mean, honestly, social media is probably the easiest place to get like kind of to the minute updates because we're posting every day. But the book will be for sale at poortaste.com. Awesome. And I'm just realizing now we didn't give a title for the damn book. <laughs> but, yeah, the book is called The Ultimate Guide to Beer Cocktails, and it contains 50 recipes, and each recipe has a seasonal twist. So there's kind of 100 recipes to it. So we'll have a recipe that we have, and then I will say, hey, for spring or summer, swap out this one ingredient and add peach brandy to the whole thing, and now you've got a whole different cocktail. So there's kind of 100 recipes. Awesome. I really love, I love how that uh, sort of just multiplies before your very eyes. It really does. Beautiful. Well, again, links to all of that stuff in the show notes. And thank you so much for sharing the history and the science and the joy of beer cocktails with us today. Yeah, dude. It was an honor. Thank you for having me. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start cocktail revolution here and by spreading the word you're helping us fight the good fight you can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear also definitely follow us on instagram and facebook at modern bar cart for cocktail porn recipes and entertaining tips and keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. 
This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, Beer Tale Truth Bombs by John Yeager, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2018.